For me, not to say anything against anything that Steve said or Russ said or John said, but uh, this is the part of this uh, conference that I've been... Hold on, i got to switch this. Oh, that's much better. Okay. This is the... Uh, the part of the conference I've been looking forward to the most. Um, when we first started talking about possibly doing this, before I even thought about a lot of other speakers, I thought this is what I want to do. And there's a very specific reason why I wanted to do this. And there's a very specific reason why each person on the platform is on the platform. Um, it's no secret that uh, eight years ago, I completely bottomed out and lost life as I knew it and life as I loved it. It was public, it was uh, embarrassing, it was scandalous in many ways. Uh, and I thought during that time I had a lot of friends. I was a popular guy, people liked being around me, I had a lot to offer. In some ways, professionally speaking, people benefited from being uh, associated with me, and then all that went away. I became a liability to everybody's brand. Um, and so people who I thought were friends slowly, some of them very quickly and immediately left. Others sort of trickled out as time went on. But there were a few who stuck and a few who stayed. Um, this church would not exist. I'm quite sure I would possibly not be alive. Um, and uh, this conference wouldn't be here. Um, my life wouldn't be what it is today, a life that I'm incredibly grateful for, uh, if it were not very specifically for Paul Zoll and Pat Thurmer. These, uh, damn. Uh, <laughs> um, these these two friends are non-blinking in the highest imaginable way. Um, thanks, honey. This is pathetic. This is reserved for, when, for women on the panel, and here I am. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I said last night, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a, I'm older and I've got a hormonal imbalance. I cry all the time now. It's kind of embarrassing, but um, I just wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for uh, Paul Zoll, who knew me well before I crashed and burned and stuck with me through the flames and is now on the other side. Uh, Pat Thurmer uh, was uh, an acquaintance of mine. He would bring a handful of people from his church on the southwest coast of Florida over to Fort Lauderdale once a year for the Liberate Conference, and we met then. Uh, and... Stacy and I were married and living in Texas, and I got a Facebook message from, from Pat, and he said, hey, I'm just checking in on you. How are you doing? And I said, you know, I'm remarried, and I'm, I'm doing relatively well. I'm alive, but I have no idea what life's going to look like going forward, and I'm still a little lost. And he said, listen, I gotta, uh, we would love to have you come here. We have a small church with an even smaller budget, so we can't offer you a job. If we had money, I would offer you a job. We can't, but we can offer you a community, a, 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 a company of people that understand what grace is. And so Stacy and I literally moved halfway across the country just to go to church there, just to be under Pat's care. Um, Nate and I knew of each other before all of that happened, but met each other after it happened. Uh, Nate, um, amongst many other things, uh, founded and leads an organization called the Sampson Society, which is very specific in its attention to men who are broken. Uh, and he has helped a lot of people that I know, his organization has. Uh, we met originally on a podcast, and then he came here and did an event with me last year. Uh, and I have discovered that almost everything that comes out of his mouth is something that I either want to hear or need to hear. Uh, he has been in the trenches with people who have fallen and failed uh, innumerable times. Uh, and he'll talk more about that. So these men are qualified for both personal and professional reasons to be on this panel. So we don't have, we, the conversation we just had in my office, the 10 minute conversation was so rich. I think we peaked a little early because I'm like, I don't know if we're going to be able to reduplicate that out here, but I wish all of you could have heard that conversation and uh, we're going to have 
that similar conversation in front of you. So, um, first of all, thank you. You guys, for those of you who are at the sanctuary, you've heard me quote Paul's all probably more than you've heard me quote Jesus, okay? So you know that uh, he's had a huge impact on me, theologically speaking, not just personally, but theologically. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Paul. Uh, I mentioned in my office that uh, after everything fell apart and I tanked my own life in 2015 in Fort Lauderdale, I moved to Orlando I was there for seven or eight months. Some things that I had done before the 2015 came to light, and so there was a second crash and burn. Not new stuff, but old stuff that came to light. Uh, and at that point, the few people who remained left. Um, and I was in a movie with Stacy, who was my girlfriend at the time, and my mother, and uh, I got a text from you, and it said, I just want you to know, dear Tullian, I'm still here. Uh, why? The, um, it was easy, uh, in principle, the first time, because of, uh, I, w I would have wanted to treat anyone that way. I would have wanted to treat it. I kept thinking about Jesus saying 70 times 7, which is 490 times. And my experience of the church had been that you're lucky if you get one <laughs> chance. And then people would say, oh, three strikes and you're out. That was from the Roman Catholic Church at one point. And they thought they were being very concessive. <laughs> and uh, I said, but he didn't say three strikes and you're out. He said, uh, he said, um, uh, 70 times 7, the, um, the difficulty came for me personally the second round mm. that, you, that, that came out in Orlando. And I just remember I was talking it over with Mary and I just said, I just can't stop. I mean, I just can't suddenly turn around because of some either recidivism, mm. which is very normal in life. I mean, people don't realize that in Victor Hugo's novel, Les Miserables, Jean Valjean is converted initially through a great act of one-way love. But then he, his sin recurs one more time after that. And it's only in the aftermath of this recidivism that it begins to sink in. And I just said to Mary, I said, I cannot, in principle, in any way, stop loving this man. And I'm, I don't care what the future holds, you know. <laughs> Who knows what tomorrow may bring? <laughs> Traffic, you know. I, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, someone would say, well, what about next time? You know, you'll never be able to trust that. And I just couldn't bring myself mm. to say that. And that's what was coming out. And I've never really looked back. Mm. No, you haven't. You haven't. Pat, you reached out, said, what are you doing? invited Stacy and I to move from Texas to Cape Coral just to be a part of the church. And you got pushback for it. You got pushback both from within and from without. You got pushback, uh, not because you were hiring me, just because you invited us to be a part of your church, um, which struck me. I was writing about this very thing the other day, and I said, how... What does it say about the church today when a sinner whose sins are well known and wants to be in church? I mean, we wanted to be in church. We didn't say, oh my gosh, we have a, we have a bad rap with those people, so we want to be out. We wanted to be in church because we knew we needed it. Um, and, you know, the church pushed back. Why, why the initial invitation? Well, first I'll say that you blessed me for years at Liberate, hmm. you know, so I mean, I admired and respected especially what you taught, so I believed it, hmm. uh, that we are liberated, and, uh, and I cared for you hmm. in spite of what happened, hmm. and uh, so I, when I initially contacted you, I really did just want to know how you were, because I saw how the church had piled on, hmm. and... Uh, I, the church is an ugly bride, and I recognize that I'm part of it, and I contribute to that ugliness, mm. 
but Christ loves the church and died for it. Hmm. And so in spite of my profound disappointment at the way the church responded to you and to others who have fallen, um, anyway, I just wanted, wanted to, to reach out to you. Hmm. I kind of cut my teeth like 49 years ago on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life together. Hmm. And in that book, he says many wonderful little things, little jewels that I've always hung on to. Mm. One is that if I consider my sinfulness to be smaller or less detestable than someone else's, I do not yet recognize my own sin. Mm. And so uh, in, this, in the view of God's absolute burning hot holiness, the difference between your sin and mine, or my sin and anyone else's, is absolutely insignificant. Hmm. Hmm. And so, it was just no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will say, I will say too that even even my congregation, that initially kind of jumped at the idea of hmm. you coming, you know, when it got down right to it, hmm. you know, then I think some muscle memory kicked in of some whatever hmm. that. The law, yeah, the law kicked in, but uh, and I prof was profoundly disappointed by that. But then I have to realize that I need to extend that same grace to them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, anyway, Nate, you've had a tremendous amount of experience in the trenches, dealing with men in particular who have crashed and burned. You've watched the church, in some cases, handle it well, but in a lot of cases, handle it very poorly. Speak to that a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, I, I quit the ministry after five years knowing that I was eventually gonna be discovered. I couldn't stop what I was doing. I had to either quit the behavior or quit the ministry, and at that point, I was so trapped, I could only quit one thing. Hmm. Um, so I'm glad that at this point, I am a civilian, and a notorious sinner. Uh, so um, s here's, what, here's what amazes me. Very often, I, we do a daily, at least one newcomer meeting online a day for the, news, for the Samson Society. I host one on Saturday morning. Last weekend, I had five guys in the meeting. Real quick, Nate, yeah. just for the people who don't know, yeah. uh, the elevator pitch for the Samson Society. Uh, yeah, it's a mutual aid society for Christian men. Not a group for sex addicts. Sex addicts are welcome. Mm. It's an uh, advantage, but not a requirement for membership. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's interesting. Five guys in the meeting. We're about 35 minutes in, and one guy lets slip that he's a pastor. I'm not surprised at all. Then two other guys, on um, the strength of his admission, admit that they also are pastors. Hmm. Now, I've, I've, run, I've had a lot of pastors in the meetings. Here's what I've noticed. It's usually guys come for help after they hit the wall, when they've run out of other options, no other place to hide. Hmm. One group that comes kind of on their own initiative before they hit the wall, pastors. Hmm. And I've encountered so much desperation among members of the clergy. Mm. I remember sitting, uh, I spoke at a conference once, and I, they went, I like to break guys into small groups afterwards to talk. And there were guys from a bunch of churches in the conference. And I knew that if I put them into small groups to have honest conversations, and it was pastors in the groups, it was going to be uncomfortable for the pastors and uncomfortable for the guys. So I said, all the pastors come with me, split the guys up. So now I'm with a dozen pastors. And the host pastor said, he opened this way, he says, I heard your story, Nate, I'm so envious that you were able to say it. He said, I feel as though the door to repentance is closed to me. If I could quit today, I could. I would. If I could quit today, I would. Mm. He felt trapped. Mm. And then I listened, and it broke my heart as we ran around the circle, and man after man voiced the same sentiment. Hmm. Uh, 
uh, but then to see how, you know, typically what happens when a guy does get caught. Mm. Or when he takes our rhetoric about grace at face value and actually admits especially a sexual failure. Mm. Yeah, it's tragic. It's tragic. I, uh, not that long ago, uh, was invited to speak to a group of men. And one of the men in leadership uh, that I had a chance to talk to just briefly, I can't be certain, but I was as certain as I could be without being absolutely certain that he was gay. Didn't come on to me in any way. I just, you know, I have enough gay friends and enough people in my life that I can, he's married, two kids. I could be wrong, uh, but I don't think I am. And I came home and I told Stacy about the weekend and told her about this guy. And I said, uh, there is no way this guy is ever going to feel safe given the environment I just experienced, telling anybody his secret, admitting his struggle, if in fact that is his struggle. And I said, what will happen, probably, because I've seen it happen time and time again, you suppress, you hide, you sneak, you find little dark corners to sort of you know, get your fix, and then you get caught. And then it's this massive scandal and the church looks at this guy and goes, how could you? And my irate response to that is you are complicit in the crime. You helped to create an environment where this guy in leadership is feeling unsafe and unable to come clean about something that is a bona fide struggle in his life for whatever reason, or a secret, or something he doesn't want anybody to know. Um, and I, I've said for years now that um, the church tends to be the scariest place rather than the safest place for fallen people to fall down and broken people to break down, uh, which reminds me of something that Pat said, which I quoted last night, where in one of our initial conversations, he said, I've been in the church for over 60 years now, and it never ceases to surprise me that the one institution that still at least theoretically believes in original sin is so amazingly shocked every time we encounter it, <laughs> which I think is um, extremely true. And then I've got this, uh, Paul was talking to a friend of mine not long ago uh, and said this, and the only reason I know is because my friend told me he said it. The church is almost, this is, a, this is an amazing quote. The church is almost 99.9% .9 of the time unable to apply its greatest gift to the sinner. When it comes to grace, God's people choke. And I've, you know, I've been wide open and out there with my own story. And as a result, people feel the freedom to come and tell me their stories. Kind of like you, Nate. You know, people come to me who don't, can't, don't feel like they can go to anybody else. And I think, like Steve said last night, part of the reason is because they go, well, he's, this guy's worse than I am, so he won't judge me. Um, so I'll go to him. Uh, and so I hear story after story, and sadly, that has proven to be true. That quote, what you said, has proven to be true over and over and over again. You've spent a lot more time inside the church than I have and have dealt with this for a long, long time. Why is that? Why, does the ch why do God's people choke on grace? Um. This is so important. I, I, I can only answer that by putting it in a, in a slightly uh, d different way. Um, what you are about at Sanctuary is a defining moment for the Christian faith. There are, are very few, you know, defining things in Christianity that are the essentials as opposed to adiaphora, which is the old expression for secondary things. And what you're talking about at this conference is a defining urgent issue because the church has failed. Mm. The church that I know across the board has profoundly failed. And um, recently I was giving a speech somewhere at a wonderful group of people and I um, just happened to mention Tullian's name. That Tullian, I felt what had happened to Tullian was a, a deep um, betrayal 
of the apostasy, of the core Christian conviction of the mercy of God to sinners. And someone in the group got so upset. Of course, he had a PCA background. But he got so <laughs> upset. But, but he got so upset at me that he, in words, made a complaint to the ecclesiastical authority. In my own in words, made a complaint to the ecclesiastical authority. And um, I then said to myself, well, I better not mention Tolling anymore. <laughs> and then Mary said, yeah, but you're going to the conference <laughs> in a week. And so what we are, let me just say, Tolly, and what you and Pat and uh, Nate are talking about, is uh, not only receives that vitriolic, Vesuvius of attack from all sorts of reasons, but it must be very important. Mm. And I thought to myself, you know, I better be prepared to be martyred for Tullian. That, that sounds heavy, right? Um, or Tullian better be prepared. Mm. Because what you're talking about is so... I mean, Jesus was crucified for this reason. He was crucified because he taught 70 times 7. And that was anathema to the world in which he lived institutionally. And it's anathema in the world in which I have lived institutionally. So I feel that, A, I'm a little nervous. I'm putting my finger towards the fire. You are the fire. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, when that song, We Didn't Start the Fire, uh, I, I'm, I'm Billy Joel. Yeah, I'm, Billy uh, Joel. I'm, uh, that's his, by the way, his musical taste is really to be questioned. Let me just say that. <laughs> Don't go there. But, only, only the emotional intelli emotionally intelligent understand it. But, but go ahead. I just want to say what you are talking about is it the absolute essence of any hope that we have for a renewal of our gospel in this world. Mm. It, is, it is the absolute uh, sticking point of the hope that we have is to um, say what you are saying. Uh, but I wonder, my wife and I are fearful sometimes mm. that I may end up, you know, uh, in a heap of stones every year. Well, we'll, uh, well you, can, you can come work here. We'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much to say, but I, so when I have something to say, I better say it. Uh, <laughs> Where there is judgment, there are secrets. Mm. And where we're judged, we hide. Mm. Um, but the good news is that God loves you. And for the sake of his crucified and resurrected son, who has taken the judgment, mm. your sins are forgiven and you are free. Mm. The Bible tells us we see through a dark, like through a dark glass. Mm. and. The older I get, the darker it seems. Mm. I see. I know less now than I ever have, mm. but I know that's true. Mm. That mm. again being that the is gospel. the gospel. You know that's true. I know that's true. I don't know much else. Mm. Mm. You know, I mean, I we talk a lot around here about some of the reasons why uh, we resist. It is finished. Some of the reasons why we resist. The idea of one-way love. We want to have skin in the game. Ever since the Garden of Eden, we have we have been fighting for our own autonomy. Uh, there is sort of a yes, grace, but flavor inside the Christian community. Um, but I'm becoming increasingly pessimistic that the church, institutionally expressed as it is currently, is almost incapable of handling the bona fide truth, the essence of Christianity. Now, I, and, and the reason I say that isn't because I'm reading books about it. It's because I'm, like Nate, I'm talking to pastors who do not feel safe in their own company of sinners that they're pastoring confessing their own sins. They, 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 they've got bills to pay. They've got kids to put through college. They know, they, they just know intuitively. I knew, I mean, I was preaching this stuff at Coral Ridge and I had a secret. And even though this company of people that I had been preaching to were gracious and they were hearing what I was saying, I just down deep knew I can't say anything to anybody. I'll lose my job and I got kids and, you know, whatever. I mean, I just... So I don't, I don't, I don't 
think, and I could be wrong, somebody give me some hope perhaps, somebody on this platform, um, but I just, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And I don't know, I don't, I, and therefore I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if there is an answer. I just know that when people ask me about, well, why are you doing what you're doing here then? I'm like, Stacy and I set up shop at a place like this with no high highfalutin goals about what this was gonna be. We just wanted to create a space where we could feel safe telling the truth about ourselves. And hopefully that would then encourage others to find their way here and feel the freedom to tell the truth about themselves. Which is why I said last night that the sanctuary is, is a uh, recovery place masquerading as a church. I think that's the best description I can give. So are there other reasons to have hope that that might change? Nate? Yeah, I, to me, the greatest hope always comes in in uh, in failure. I think that um, you know a gospel that is not uh, expressed in love and is not driven entirely by grace is going to fail. Uh, the church that preaches that gospel is going to lose all relevance. It's, it's not attractive. The gospel is attractive. Hmm. Okay. It's going to die. I like, uh, I like doing intake at Samson Society. I like having that first conversation with the guy who just hit the wall hmm. when everything, the shit hit the fan, everything went to hell, hmm. and, and it's done. And what I love to tell the guy is, I know it feels like the worst day of your life, but this may very well be the best day of your life. Hmm. <laughs> because now you have a chance. You're not hiding anymore. Hmm. And any affirmation that you get, attention you get, love, I mean, it's going to be real. You, you know, now you can really experience the gospel because you're hmm. not hiding anymore. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Hmm. And to watch a guy come alive spiritually in recovery, mm. as I did, mm. is one of the most beautiful things in the world. Mm -hmm. So is the church spontaneously going to forsake its Phariseeism? I didn't. To me, when I get really mad at the Phariseeism of the church, I remember that the reason I didn't confess my sin to the church mm. was because I knew what I did when other guys got caught in theirs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Me. Mm -hmm. I participated mm -hmm. in the discipline <laughs> of those men. Somehow going to teach myself a lesson by teaching them one. And mm. even if I wasn't throwing the rocks, I was holding the coats. Mm. Yeah, that's good. See, but the, what you're, you're seeing that happen in a recovery environment. Yeah. I see it happen in recovery environments. Uh, recovery places that I go to, to visit and share, are some of my most favorite visits because it's so much more refreshing to sit in a room with people who know that they're bad than to sit in a room with people who think that they're good. Mm -hmm. So much more refreshing. People who know that they're weak rather than people who think that they're strong. And I oftentimes leave those experiences and think, man, if every local church could be like this, my gosh. But the fact of the matter is they're not. I mean, so you see that I see the same thing, but I don't see that. No, I don't see everything, obviously, but it just across the board, generically speaking, I don't see that happening often inside the church. I mean, in the last... Mine was 2015, so you you know you probably go back a couple years before that. I, I did some of the numbers. There were like in a, in a, like an, a 10 year span, there were like eight or 10 of us who were kind of peers from different places who either crashed and burned for whatever reason. Some of it was uh, misappropriation of funds. Some of it was abusive leadership. Some of it was affair. Whatever uh, or three of them that I know killed themselves. I mean, guy, uh, the, one of the guys who first spoke at Liberate shot himself just a few years ago. Um, and I'm just going, man, the desperation is so intense that someone would rather kill themselves than tell the truth to their Christian friends. I mean, that is, 
it's a scandal to me. So I don't, that's where my pessimism comes from. I don't see it happening inside the church, if that makes sense. Uh, Tully, and I, I happen to sadly agree with you uh, 100%. And I'm a, I'm a kosher, I'm a, I'm a priest in good standing of the Episcopal Church, not one of the offshoots. And um, <laughs> the, uh, what I would say is that um, I look for the church where the Holy Spirit of God has landed like a little, uh, uh, you know, tornado. I see your church as one. Uh, my eldest son is the rector of an Episcopal church up in the New York area, and he's preaching the gospel. He's not preaching the law. And I see a little tornado of the Holy Spirit landing there. I see it in Mockingbird, uh, which David Zoll uh, is so involved in. Um, there was a book that you all must read called The Misunderstanding of the Church from about 1932 by Emil Brunner, B-R-U-N-N-E-R, -N -N the Swiss theologian. It's only about 80 pages, and he proves he was a very uh, celebrated academic theologian from Switzerland, and he basically proves from the New Testament that Jesus never founded an institutional church. Hmm. Never founded an institutional church. So what I'm doing now, I'm looking for where... Uh, didn't Russ Johnson talk about friendship? Mm -hmm. Didn't he talk about friendship? I'm I, get, I get more of the church from an African-American Pentecostal church that I go to sometimes mm. in terms of love, mm. love and hope. Mm. I get it in a son's church here. Mm. I get it here at the mm. sanctuary mm. very clearly. And um, that's the church mm. for me. Mm. But I do feel that the lampstand has been removed mm. from a great many of the official mm. denominational mm. structures. I wish I didn't. Pat, you're a churchman. You've seen it. I mean, your, your original quote to me was, you know, I've been in the church for... 60 some odd years and I'm not exactly sure why we are so surprised at original sin. Well, my pastor is sitting right over there, so I gotta be careful. <laughs> I'm, writing, I'm writing him a, a complaint about you. <laughs> but, yeah, I think, well, there's different congregations, I think is, is key. It's in the congregation. Mm. The, the denominational structures kind of mm. irrelevant to me. Mm. But what's your question? I don't know if I had one. It's you know, it's a very dangerous thing to say, Pat. Just riff on whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> it lasts about four seconds. If you've ever heard, so. Pat is one of the greatest preachers I've ever heard in my life. He's never preached a sermon longer than 12 minutes. He's preached here a handful of times, for those of you who remember. Uh, and I warned our people. I said, now listen, I, I don't want you to get used to this idea of 12-minute sermons, because that's one week only, and then I'm back. Um, but you are loved here. He is a, a man of few words, but those few words are always potent and life-giving. Um, I have a friend named Nadia who's crazy, wild. She's a, uh, an inc uh, a, a Lutheran pastor um, and not conservative by any stretch of the imagination, but she gets the gospel. Uh, and she says, one of the reasons I'm so out there in telling the truth about myself is that in doing so, I'm hoping to create a space where other people can feel safe telling the truth about themselves too. She said, it's a leadership style I like to call, screw it, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, and I love that. And I, I've, I've, uh, I, that was actually the working title of this book that I'm working on, Screw It, I'll Go First. Um, but yeah, I know, that's, I, I, I got some of that from others also. Um, but, uh, but in less local congregations, are led by people who are willing to screw it and go first. I'm not just talking about the preacher, but the leadership. Right. We're, we're the ones telling the truth about ourselves in the hope that an environment will be created where other people will feel the safety and the freedom to tell the truth about themselves. It's the only hope that I have. Would you be willing to die for this mission? Or would you be willing to give everything up. I'm just, I really, because I feel that's what you're really pointing towards. Yeah, no, the answer world, that's no. The answer is no. I'm sure there's something that I'd be like, okay, not that. I mean, if it was 
you know, you can keep doing this, uh, but I'm gonna take, uh, but I'm gonna take Jenna's life. I'd probably stand down because I'm, I'm not nearly as faithful as I would like to be, devoted, committed. It's not. I mean, I, I am, and I'm not. I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs> you know. Boy, Pat's got something to say. Everyone, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's something about having a confessor, someone close to you that you confess your sin mm -hmm. to. I mean, everything doesn't have to be public. No, gosh, no. And, and it I, shouldn't be. My confessor here is here, Carl mm. Cook. Mm. He's been my friend since seminary, mm. and we confess our sins to each other mm. and absolve each other. Mm. And that's what has to happen. Mm -hmm. I think needs to happen. People need a confessor mm. in their life, a priest, yeah, to declare forgiveness to you. We sat in your church for two years, and you were, uh, my mom says there's a distinction between being uh, honest on the one hand and being uh, unwisely indiscriminate on the other. And she's right about that. No one likes to be vomited on. Sometimes people hear me talk about telling the truth about yourself, and then they just go, okay, I'm free, I'm free. Thank God I'm free. And they just start vomiting all of their trauma on everybody around them. That's not attractive. It's not fun. It's not what you should do. What Pat's describing is something much more appropriate. Find someone or someones that you can be totally honest with, completely open to. Uh, I, I'm, I, I have to add yeah. my wife, my wife to Carla. Well, there are certain things that you've told me that you made me swear I would never tell your wife. So I, I'm not going to let you sit up here on stage and lie in front of these good people. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, but I think I, I, as, as important as I think it is, and we all need those people, there's still some hope that I have that if, and you did this, you did this for Stacy and me and you did it for everybody that was under your care. You appropriately told the truth about yourself from behind the pulpit every Sunday. I mean, you just, you acknowledged your own desperation and your own need for grace, that you knew you were no better than anybody in the room. And that was, the, the resistance that you got inside the church, inside your church for having Stacy and I there uh, and let's be honest, it wasn't for having Stacy there. It was for having me there. She just got some egg on her because she was standing next to me. But um, was only from a select few. The vast majority of your people were welcoming and comforting and gracious and kind. And, uh, but that's because you had the guts, the God-graced guts, to tell them about your own need for grace, your own sin and your own need for grace. I, I, I keep going back to this, where is the hope? And I don't know, you know, I just, I think the only, the only place where I typically land is pulpits, like Robert Cabin says, need to be filled with derelict nobodies who profess to be sinners and actually mean it. Um, Actually, actually mean and it. actually mean it. Yeah. What's the, the one, um, oh, it's the one book, it's the um, autobiography of Oh, what is it, Mark? No, what is it? Yes. Autobiography of Mark. Yes, and I, I, it's so so perfect. The illustration you gave me one time about a guy, a preacher, this is in the, the author's church that he grew up in, and he said this preacher would, uh, every week the pastor would stand up and talk about you know how he's the worst person he knows and how he's a sinner and how much he needs God's grace. It says how, and everybody loved him for it. But had he actually confessed one actual sin, he would have been ostracized. Exactly. So minute. it's kind of my, my friend Nadia, when everything happened in 2015, I, one of the first texts I got, uh, this is going to make all of you laugh. The first text I got was from John Piper. The second text I got was from Nadia Boltz Weber. Okay, you couldn't, I, I, you, I mean, two opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, it just tells you how diplomatic I am. I can have friends everywhere. Um, but she said, um, she, what did she say? She said, uh, people love it when you stand up and tell them that you're a broken person just like they are until you do something that broken people do. That's, she's right. And then you're exiled. 
Exile. Um, and I, you know, I, I would still be in exile if it wasn't for you guys. I mean, you, Paul, in particular, and you, Pat. I mean, you, Paul, you, I, I, <laughs> I however... I almost reached the 70 times seven with this one. Maybe not with God, but with this one, I came really, really close to hitting that ceiling. Um, I mean, you lived through my absolute darkest days with me. My darkest days. I have a photograph of you uh, and me in our house in Florida the night that you hit the 70 times seven, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. It was after that night that I said to Mary, I, I, have, a, I have the photograph, you look great. Um, uh, and I, I said to Mary, I said, can, can I really do this? And we questioned it, but I, I, I nevertheless was given mm. to do it. Mm. But I have a photograph of that night. <laughs> Just thought I'd share that. <laughs> but it was a very I'd like to see that photograph. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't state uh, more strongly how grateful I am for the two of you in particular. You, uh, Paul's all wrote a book called Grace and Practice, which I highly, highly recommend. Read it, read it again and again and again. Is it back there? I couldn't find any extra copies, but uh, the other books are there. Yeah. Really wonderful Don't books. get the other books, but, but Grace and Practice, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just uh, What I tell, I heard R.C. Sproul say this one time at a conference. He said, he was saying, hey, my books are out there and da-da-da-da-da. And he said, listen, I actually don't care if you read the book. Just buy the book. <laughs> I was like, that's perfectly said. That's what most authors think. Um, but Paul wrote the book Grace and Practice, and there is a huge difference I discovered between grace on paper and grace in practice when it comes to interpersonal relationships. Uh, and you believe, you believe this stuff. You're, you're that crazy to actually believe it. And I'm a beneficiary of that belief. And you, Pat, you didn't just open up your life, you and Carla's life and your family, but your church. People that you were entrusted to care for and love and protect, and you swung those front doors wide open for me. And uh, and Nate, I've never felt, even in our limited interaction, that you were someone I couldn't just spill my guts to, and you wouldn't blink. Never. Um, I've seen you not blink with other people that I know. Uh, sin doesn't shock you. I say on a regular basis. I want. I want the church to feel like a place where sin does not shock and grace still amazes. Uh, and sin doesn't shock you. Sin doesn't shock any of you. Uh, and that has given me life. So all three of you in different ways have given me life. And I, uh, if this fallen and free is a one and done. I, we'll probably do it next year. Who knows? We'll, we'll see. But um, we'll debrief and figure out if it's something we want to do again. If, it's, if this is a one and done, uh, then this has been primarily a gift to me to be able to say thank you to people who have loved me and stuck with me when nobody else was loving me and sticking with me. You guys are non-blinking, sticky friends, and I would be dead if it wasn't for you guys. I mean it, and Stacy knows that to be true because I say it all the time. St. Patrick, St. Paul, uh, I say it all the time, all the time, so I'm incredibly grateful. Um, I have no idea what time it is, and I don't know if we're out of time. Um, what? A couple more minutes, yeah. So any final thoughts, words, words of... Well, I would say this about one-way love, that when you are really loved by somebody else in your distress and your need, it has an automatic, an automatic dynamic uh, um, effect on, on you. 
Uh, it never fails. Mm. It is a never failing change agent. I was recently uh, talking to Mary. Uh, she has a real rebirth of affection for an old friend that she's known for many years, but she's been actively helping this woman in a very difficult situation. And I said, Mary, what, what happened? I mean, you always liked her, but now you're, you're actively, you're working very hard to help this woman in a difficult situation. And then I remembered when Mary was extremely ill last spring and my wife got deathly ill uh, during a period last spring, this woman, out of the blue, you might say, context, proved to be a major friend to mm -hmm. Mary. I mean, she, she was there every day. She just loved and loved and loved for no particular reason. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, that created the response of love. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the church, that's what God does. You, you, someone, I mean, surely there's someone in your life who loved you when you were, like Tolly and us talking about, there has to have been somebody. And w what happens when a, a guy is, is an old man is sick and he, a nurse helps him. What does he always want to do with his nurse? He wants to marry her. <laughs> I mean, every every I'm a, I must have married forty different eighty year old men <laughs> to their to their to their nurses. <laughs> and I would say, why are you you have nothing in common with this person? You have she's not a gold you know digger. Uh, she doesn't look all that great from a human point of view. Why are you? Ma what? Well, but you don't understand. She was willing to clean me up when I was uh, recovering from cancer surgery. So one way love inevitably makes mm. you want to marry the mm. guy yeah. and so um it's automatic luther said it was automatic the response of love is automatic mm. when it comes from one way love when you're in a bad situation mm. and that is the essence of the gospel mm. Mm. it is uh you wrote in grace and practice that uh when we are loved at our worst, you say, you know, try to call to memory like you just did uh, an occasion where you deserved judgment and was given grace instead. What did that do to you? I have a thousand stories about how my dad handled me in that way. He was the embodiment of grace to me. Uh, as much as I love and admire and respect all three of you, he was the greatest man who ever walked this earth, uh, in my very humble and extremely biased opinion. Uh, there are a couple others in this room who would agree with me. Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, but I, I have a hundred examples of ways in which, at, at moments in which I got caught with my hand in the cookie jar, metaphorically speaking, with my dad, and his response was almost always gracious. And that made me feel bad for what I did and not want to do it again. Yeah. So I, I, you know, when people, when people say, both John and Russ alluded to this earlier, but when people say, if you peddle this grace stuff, this forgiveness stuff, this unconditional love stuff too much, people are going to become serial killers. Yeah, they'll, take advantage. they'll take advantage of it, which I say we're, we're taking advantage of it anyway all day, but it doesn't matter. Um, so I just, they said, you know, people will get worse. And the example I always give is if I've had a bad day. And I come home and I take out that bad day on Stacy. I'm short with her. I'm snippy with her. I'm, I'm, I'm not being loving. I'm being critical. And she can sense that I've clearly had a bad day and it has nothing to do with her. But I'm taking it out on her. And instead of reciprocating, she comes up to me and puts her hand on either side of my face and says, honey, clearly you've had a bad day. I just want you to know I love you no matter what. That's not going to make me want to continue being a jerk. That's going to immediately make me go, gosh, dang it, honey. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not you. I'm sorry. And it's going to make me want to be sweeter. So this idea that being a recipient of, un like, in order for someone to really change, we need to give them tough love. It's like, dude, it never works. It's an empirical fallacy. It, it's an empirical fallacy. Absolutely. It, it doesn't work. I mean, do more, try harder only makes people want to quit. It's all it does. Uh, and so I just think that this skepticism out there that exists with regard to if we, if we give, I, okay, this is very, very, very personal uh, example. Uh, it has to do with a couple of my friends in the room. Uh, I mentioned last night that Mark over here was my worship leader at Coral Ridge for a couple of years. Uh, he crashed in a similar way that I did and let him go. Uh, different circumstances, but my friend Trey here, 
uh, who's our worship leader now, uh, recently went through a divorce uh, and by his own admission would say, I was waiting for the call to say, you're sidelined or you're done. Um, I completely botched the way I handled Mark. And uh, in part, uh, along with others, uh, would not even think about handling that same situation with Trey. Not even think about it. And it reminds you of a story that Tim Keller said uh, one time where he said, you know, I went, I went in to get a, what's the thing we need to check for? Colon, colonoscopy. He said, I went in to get a colonoscopy, which I, apparently I need one now because I'm 50, but. Uh, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, <laughs> that was, oh, that's the, that's the line of the conference right there. <laughs> Dang, that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> I can sell. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but he said, I went in for a colonoscopy, and he said the doctor had just terrible bedside manner. It was kind of rough. and da -da 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 -da. Just, He said it was a horrible experience, in part because of the rough bedside manner of the, of the uh, doctor. He said, a year later, I went back to get another colonoscopy, and he said the same doctor treated me with, like, kid gloves. And I was, he said, I was totally confused as to what happened. So he said, I, I asked the nurse after he left the room. He said, what happened to that guy? And she said, he had a colonoscopy three months ago. <laughs> 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 but it takes, I mean, I, I hate, I hate on the one hand that uh, I botched it so bad with Mark. And then two years or three years later, went through the same exact thing. But that botching and my own personal failure helped me approach Trey completely differently. And so this idea that failure is our greatest enemy is a lie. Like Steve was saying last night, it is our greatest gift when we know it. And like Russ was saying this morning, that's the way out is always at the bottom. So, so uh, I didn't want to embarrass either of you guys, but I, I love both of you very much. Uh, like I said last night, nobody on this stage, including me, uh, just James is the one that sanitizes the entire platform. Um, so, yes. Well, I have a middle son who's a gastric surgeon. You have a wife? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, any final words? Thank you, mm. Talian, for this weekend, and mm. Stacy and the sanctuary. Mm. Mm. Uh, very, nice, very nicely done. Mm, thank you. I have one final thing. You, you, your, your talk last night was as, uh, as crystalline and as uh, powerful and fruitful as any talk I've ever heard you give. But one of the things you said was very important, that we're, we're never wholly healed. Mm. What is the word? We're marked but not healed. Uh, we can be healed but not whole. We can be healed but not whole. But what I found, what's so profound about that, is as soon as I realize that I'm healed but not necessarily 100% healed, I get 10% more healed. Mm -hmm. it, the strangest thing about realizing that the healing is not, quote, humanly complete, <laughs> that when I accept it, then for some strange reason, the healing advances mm -hmm. rather than re regressing. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was very powerful insight mm -hmm. on your part. We are, in fact, getting healed. Mm -hmm. But often the latter stages occur when we realize we haven't been fully healed. Another way of saying it, perhaps, in a little bit of different words, is when I finally admit that, I really, that I'm really not getting that much better, that's the first sign that I may be getting better. That's yeah. what I meant. Yeah, that's it. Nate, anything? Any final words? No, it's just been a it's been a joy to be here and not to have major responsibility. I've just got to listen to all this great teaching. It's been wonderful. Uh, who, who do I write the check to? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> the housing market in Jupiter is ridiculous, and Stacy and I are saving. Um, I do have a. Um, I want to close with this quote from you, Nate. Uh, the name of your book is? Samson and the Pirate Monks. Are they here? No. Oh, okay. Well, uh, get that book too. Um, 
and Pat's uh, Pat's memoir will be out sometime this year, right, Pat? <laughs> no, but you, Pat, he, that's a joke, but he, he does, he has envisioned writing a devotional. What's the title of it? I love the, I love the working title of your devotional. His utmost for my highest. Yeah, his utmost for my highest. <laughs> See what he did there? Um, Joel Osteen wrote a, wrote a book, not uh, this was probably seven or eight years ago, saying, I can, I will. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I was preaching a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments, and the whole point was to show we, we can't do any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. So thank God for Jesus. Uh, and so I said, I, I want to I write a book on the Ten Commandments saying, I can't, I won't. Uh, um, so this is from Nate, and it gets to what you just said. It gets to what I said last night. The road ahead does not run through the improvement of the old self, but through the acceptance of the new one, the real me. I am finding a life, not constructing one. And I think that really gets to the, really gets to the heart of it. So thank you guys.